So since I forgot to click the start recording button uh, during lecture, this is a very short uh, walkthrough of what we went over in the lecture. So uh, in the previous lecture, we learned uh, the application of aerodynamic forces, particularly lift, right? So we have learned the concept of lift is generated by moving fluid in the orthogonal direction as the direction of the travel. So today we are going to focus more on drag and uh, energy consumption. And uh, uh, as you're going to see, drag involves a bit more conservation loss than just uh, the conservation of uh, momentum. And uh, in particular, we want to first uh, review a little bit of the conservation loss. So we first uh, did a uh, experiment in class. So essentially, we have a tape, a curved surface, and we dumped water onto the curved surface. And what we see is that the water kind of follows the curved surface and uh, then drops uh, with a different momentum as the downward momentum of the incoming flow. So the question here is that uh, uh, with the surface, in our case a tape, right, uh, would move into the stream or away from the stream? Most, most of the students got it right in terms of, uh, that the surface is getting pulled into the stream. And there are three different ways of analyzing this phenomena. The first way is basically using Newton's second law. So if you follow a droplet of surface, uh, a droplet of uh, water uh, following the curved surface, you're going to see that it changes the x-directional momentum. The x-momentum changes from zero because the water comes almost downward uh, towards a positive value because after it follows the curved surface it now starts to move towards the right in order for the water to gain an x momentum it has to receive a positive x directional force right and uh, where does the force come from right it has to come from the surface so by newton's third law the surface should receive an equal but opposite force from the water droplets. That means the force on the surface is towards the minus x direction, which means the surface is going to get pulled into the stream. All right, so this is the first way. The second way is the second and third way are both using conservation of momentum, but with different control volumes. The first way draws a control volume in blue just around the water stream, not including the curved surface. So in that case, the force between the water stream and the surface counts as external force to the water stream. Right? Now if you analyze the uh, momentum equation, which I write over here, so suppose we hold the tape fixed right so the tape is not moving which means if the water flow is steady state the left hand side of the momentum equation the ddt term is exactly equal to zero so this term is gone then the whole right hand side has to equal to zero so what is the sign of the first term okay so let's look at the first term without the minus sign so without the minus sign and let's just look at the x directional momentum equation right so the first term has several components from different parts of the surface of this control volume. On the left and right of the stream, because the boundary follows a streamline, u dot with n would be exactly equal to zero. So that's actually what defines the streamline, is that the velocity is actually going to be orthogonal right, uh, to the normal of that surface defined by a streamline. So u dot with n is equal to zero on the streamlines. So the only part where u dot n is not equal to zero is on top and on the bottom of this control volume. Now on top of the control volume, we said ux is almost equal to zero because the water goes almost downwards from the top. So ux would be equal to zero and this term is equal to zero also at the top. And the only part of non-zero contribution would be at the bottom, where ux is equal to positive value, right, because the water goes towards the right, and u dot n 
Remember, n is the outward normal, and here u flows out, right, of, of the control volume. So u dot n would be positive. So the whole integral without the minus sign would be positive. Now, that means with the minus sign, the whole first term is going to be negative, and the external forces have to be positive in order to balance, in order to make the whole right hand side equal to zero, which means the external forces have to be positive, right? There has to be a positive external force towards the water stream, which means there is going to be equal and opposite force of the water stream towards the external surface. Now, that force has a negative sign in the x direction, which means the curved surface is going to be pulled towards the negative x direction. So this is the second way, using conservation of momentum with the blue control volume. The third way is using the red control volume, including this external surface, the tape. All right. So in that case, all the external forces would vanish in the x direction because the only force external to the whole system would be gravity, which is not in the x direction. All right. Now, uh, basically, these uh, first term on the right hand side, which we know through the same analysis, right, which we know is going to be negative, has to equal to the left hand side, which also then has to be negative. The whole left hand side involves the rate of momentum change of the entire system. Since it has to be negative, the entire system has to start gaining a negative acceleration, right, which means the tape with the water has to start accelerating towards the left. So this is the third way using also conservation of momentum. All right, so this case is actually very similar to the analysis of lift, right? Because we are looking at a scenario where the force is in almost the orthogonal direction as the traveling of the fluid. And one thing to remember here is that here, the external forces did not involve the pressure in the inflow and outflow. This is because we are looking at water here, which is a thousand times denser than air. And what is surrounding the water is actually air, right? And air is very light and doesn't move much in this particular scenario, which means the pressure in the inflow and outflow should be pretty much the same. Otherwise, air, the surrounding air, would be moved by this pressure difference with tremendous velocity, which did not happen in the experiment. Okay, um, what we went through next is a few concept questions. So in this case, everybody got it right. The inflow balances the outflow, right, through conservation of, uh, conservation of mass, and uh, we would have A, the change rate of change in the total mass within the system would be, be equal to zero. What we didn't get right is the conservation of momentum. So exactly the same, same scenario. We were asking, okay, would the change of momentum in this volume be positive or negative? In this case, because we have no idea what is the pressure in the inlet, what is the pressure in the outlet, we don't know, right, if the change of momentum in the volume is zero or non-zero. So the choice would be C, not enough information. We would only know if it's A or B if we know what the pressure is in the inlet, what the pressure is at the outlet, even if we know there is no forces, no other forces other than pressure forces involved. There is always pressure forces involved in the fluid flow. All right. So now uh, we have looked at conservation of mass and momentum. We start looking at drag. And drag actually involves not just the conservation of mass and momentum, but conservation of energy. Looking at drag using energy is very convenient because unlike lift, which does zero work, if you either choose the frame of reference of the solid object or the frame of reference of the incoming air or free stream, right? So with either choice of frame of reference, lift actually doesn't do any work. But drag always do work 
no matter if you choose the frame of reference of the solid object, the airplane, then drag actually does force to the air. Or if you choose the frame of reference of the free stream of the air, then drag does work to the flying object. So looking at drag using energy and work is actually a very convenient way. All right. So in this case, uh, we did uh, uh, we asked everybody to go to the board and uh, figure out this question. So we are looking at a fluid flow across a cylinder in a water tunnel. So here we see that uh, water kind of flows past the cylinder, and but there is a of fluid in the way so this volume okay. of fluid, uh, there is some random motions, but overall, not on that, they don't move the lower the lower the lower the the lower right. so which means if you take the frame of reference, of fluid has to move the Now the question is, uh, what is the mass of fluid set in motion by the cylinder in one second, right? So basically the fluid in its wake is set in motion by the cylinder. And uh, uh, what is that mass per second? Second question is, assuming the fluid is set to move forward at the same speed as the cylinder, how much kinetic energy per second does it require to set the fluid in motion? So here we worked out the answer over here, which almost everybody got it right. And finally, to get to drag, we are asking how much mechanical power does it require to propel the cylinder? Now this is a conservation of energy argument, right? So if the cylinder doesn't slow down or doesn't accelerate, then the energy within a control volume, within a fixed control volume around the cylinder is conserved. So any additional energy that is passed into the wake, that is shed into the wake, right? Remember. Uh, we always have like fluid, more fluid that moves with the cylinder behind it. So uh, the amount of kinetic energy that comes out of the control volume is going to be exactly the same as the input energy, right, by propelling the cylinder forward. So that will be the same answer as question two. Now we know that how much power it is required to propel the cylinder so that it doesn't slow down we are asking what is the drag? Now because the cylinder is assumed to not slow down, the drag actually balances whatever force that propels that cylinder, right? So the drag has to equal to the propulsive force, which does work with this particular amount of power. So if you divide the power by the velocity, right, power is equal to force times velocity, you get the force that propels the cylinder and thereby the force of the drag. So the drag is equal to this, and if you do the division uh, by the aerodynamic pressure, half of rho v square, and by the area to get the drag coefficient, we see that is exactly equal to 1. So in fact, you can think about what drag coefficient is using this simple example. Drag coefficient can be thought of as how much fluid is dragged by a moving object behind in its wake. A CD equal to 1 means it is dragging as much fluid as its frontal area to move forward with the object at the same speed as the object. If you have an object with CD much, much less than 1, that means it has a tiny wake, right? The wake is much, much smaller in its area and uh, potentially moves with less velocity compared to the moving of the solid object. All right, so here are some examples of drag coefficients. And as you can see, uh, a more aerodynamic body would have a smaller wake and therefore a less drag coefficient. Well, we watched the video of people uh, posing a Superman position in a, in a bike and that kind of minimizes the drag coefficient, uh, minimizes the drag by reducing how much air is dragged behind the cyclist. Uh, finally, we went through what are the drag coefficients of very aerodynamic bodies.
right? So for, for objects uh, without flow separation, basically you can compute the drag by integrating the skin friction coefficient, which for typically sized airplanes would be around 0.2% as the skin friction coefficient. And uh, uh, that's it. And uh, uh, we are going to be meet again on Wednesday.